Well, speaking of worldly concerns, our Lord cautioned us not to be anxious, wondering, quote, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the heathens seek. For your Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Close quote, God the Son. Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's God the Son commanding us to seek his kingdom and his justice before all else. But how many people, how many people will actually call themselves Christian? How many of us are actually seeking first the kingdom of God and his justice? How many people that you know actually put God first in everything? Sure, most people have him in the stack somewhere, but how many people that you know, how many Christians do you know that actually put the kingdom of God and his justice first before their worldly concerns? It's not very many, is it? And all that is the context for the topic we're going to tackle today. As usual, I'll cut, paste, and edit quotes. Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton was one of the most outstanding Thomistic theologians of the last century. At Vatican II, Monsignor Fenton was a member of the Preparatory Theological Commission, the Doctrinal Commission, the Commission on Faith and Morals, and he also served as a paritas. That's a, a $3 word that means a, a theological expert. He's a theologian for Carl Otto Vianney, who is the head of the Holy Office. The Holy Office is now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Some 50 years ago, Monsignor Fenton wrote, quote, It is a dogma of the Catholic faith that the Roman Catholic Church, the religious organization of which the Bishop of Rome presides, is actually the one and only supernatural kingdom of God on earth, the one and only institution outside of which no one at all is saved and outside of which there is no remission of sins. The great mystery of the dispensation of the New Testament is the outstanding truth that this visible society, this organization in which bad members are mingled with the good, is actually the one and only supernatural kingdom of God on earth. There are people that flinch at this truth, and some of them, unfortunately, are within the folds of the Catholic Church itself. It is obviously one of the truths most frequently attacked in our own time. It is a truth which we are most tempted to overlook or to pass over in order that we may make the teaching of the Catholic Church more acceptable to those who are not of the Catholic faith. Some have tried to explain away the Catholic dogma that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, but the instruction of the Holy Office of August 8, 1949, made it very clear to the men of our own time that the Church had by no means abandoned or modified the age-old dogma to the effect there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Close quotes. So on this great feast of Pentecost, the birthday, as it were, of the Catholic Church, let's try to get a deeper understanding of the dogma that there is no salvation outside the Church. We'll start by turning to that document, which was issued on August 8, 1949, by the Holy Office. Again, the Holy Office is now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. I quote, We are bound by divine and Catholic faith to believe all those things which are contained in the Word of God, whether it be Scripture or tradition, and are proposed by the Church to be believed as divinely revealed, not only through solemn judgment, but also through the ordinary and universal teaching office. Now, among those things which the Church has always preached and will never cease to preach is contained also that infallible statement by which we are taught that there is no salvation outside the Church. However, this dogma must be understood in that sense in which the Church herself understands it. In the first place, the Church teaches that in this matter there is question of a most strict 
commandment of Jesus Christ. Among the commandments of Christ, we are commanded to be incorporated by baptism into the mystical body of Christ, which is the Church, and to remain united to Christ and his vicar, the Pope, through whom Christ himself, in a visible manner, governs the Church on earth. Therefore, no one will be saved who, knowing the Church to have been divinely established by Christ, nevertheless refuses to submit to the Church or withholds obedience from the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth. That's worth repeating. No one will be saved who, knowing the Church to have been divinely established by Christ, nevertheless refuses to submit to the Church or withholds obedience from the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth. To continue, not only did the Savior command that all nations should enter the Church, but he also decreed the Church to be a means of salvation without which no one can enter the kingdom of eternal glory. In his infinite mercy, God has willed that the effects necessary for one to be saved can also be obtained in certain circumstances when those helps are used only in desire and longing. This we see clearly stated in the Sacred Council of Trent, both in reference to the sacrament of regeneration, that's baptism, and in reference to the sacrament of penance, that's, of course, confession. The same in its own degree must be asserted of the Church, in as far as she is the general help to salvation. Therefore, that one may obtain eternal salvation, it is not always required that he be incorporated to the Church actually as a member, but it is necessary that at least he be united to her by desire and longing. However, this desire need not always be explicit, as it is in catechumens. But when a person is involved in invincible ignorance, God accepts also an implicit desire, so-called because it is included in that good disposition of soul, whereby a person wishes his will to be conformed to the will of God. These things are clearly taught in the 1943 encyclical of Pope Pius XII on the mystical body of Jesus Christ. In this letter, the Sovereign Pontiff clearly distinguishes between those who are actually incorporated in the Church as members and those who are united to the Church only by desire. But it must not be thought that any kind of desire of entering the Church suffices that one may be saved. It is necessary that the desire by which one is related to the Church be animated by perfect charity, nor can an implicit desire produce its effect unless a person has supernatural faith. Close quotes. Okay, quick review. What have we seen? We've seen it's a dogma of the Catholic faith that the Roman Catholic Church is actually the one and only supernatural kingdom of God on earth, the one and only institution outside of which no one all is saved, and outside of which there's no remission of sins. We've seen it's a great mystery, this visible society, this organization in which so many bad members are mingled with the good, is actually the one and only supernatural kingdom of God on earth. We've seen this is one of the truths most frequently attacked in our time. We've seen this as a truth in which we may be gravely tempted to overlook or to pass over in the order that we may make the teaching of the Catholic Church more acceptable to those who are not of the faith. We've seen that this infallible truth must be understood in the sense in which the Church herself understands it. We've seen that Christ commands us to be incorporated by baptism into his mystical body, which is the Church. We've also seen that Christ commands us to remain united to him and to the Pope, through whom Christ himself governs the Church here on earth. We've seen that as a consequence, no one will be saved, who, knowing full well that the Church was divinely established by Christ, still refuses to submit to the Church or withdraws obedience, withholds obedience from the Pope, the victor of Christ on earth. We've seen that Christ our Lord decreed the Church to be a means of salvation without which no one can enter the kingdom of eternal glory. We've seen that in order to be saved, it is not always necessary that a man be actually incorporated to the Church as a member, but it is necessary that he at least be united to her by desire and longing. And we've seen that desire to belong to the Church need not always be explicit as it is in catechumens, but that when a Church is invincibly ignorant, God accepts an implicit desire, which is called implicit because it is included in the good disposition of soul, whereby a person wishes his will to be conformed to the will of God. Okay. Now let's try to come to a deeper understanding of this dogma 
and do that will rely largely on a work written in 1865 by Father Michael Mueller, a redemptorist priest. Is it not all the same to God, whatever religion a person professes? If it were all the same to God, whatever religion a person professes, God would not have forbidden in the first commandment to worship him in any other than the true religion. Nor would Christ solemn declared, he will not hear the church, let him be to thee as the heathen and the publican. Who then will be saved? Christ has solemnly declared that only those will be saved who have done God's will on earth, as explained, not by private interpretation, but by the infallible teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Not everyone, says Christ, who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. The will of the Heavenly Father is that all men hear and believe his Son, Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son, hear him. Now Christ said to his apostles and to all their lawful successors, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him, the heavenly Father that sent me. Hence all those who do not listen to Christ speaking to them through St. Peter and the apostles and their lawful successors despise God the Father. They do not do his will, and therefore heaven will never be theirs. Must then all who wish to be saved die united to the Catholic Church? All those who wish to be saved must die united to the Catholic Church. For out of her there is no salvation, because only she teaches what Christ requires of everyone to be saved, and because only to her did Christ leave the means to obtain all the graces necessary for salvation. Hence Christ said to his apostles and to all their lawful successors, Go and teach all nations. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He that believeth not all these things shall be condemned. Our divine Savior says, No one can come to the Father except through me. If then we wish to enter heaven, we must be united to Christ, to his mystical body, which is the church, as St. Paul says. Therefore, outside the church, there is no salvation. Again, Christ says, Whoever not hear the church, look upon him as a heathen and a publican, a great sinner. Therefore, outside the church, there is no salvation. Holy Scripture says in Acts 2.47, The Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. Therefore the apostles believed, and the Holy Scriptures teach that there is no salvation out of the church. Who are out of the pale of the Roman Catholic Church? Out of the pale of the Roman Catholic Church are all unbaptized and all excommunicated persons, all apostates, unbelievers, and heretics. How many kinds of infidels or unbelievers are there? There are three kinds of infidels or unbelievers. Number one, those who are guilty of the sin of infidelity. Number two, those who are not guilty of the sin of infidelity but commit other mortal sins. Number three, those who are not guilty of the sin of infidelity and who live up to the dictates of their conscience. So those are the three categories. Those guilty of the sin of infidelity, those not guilty of the sin of infidelity but guilty of other grave sins, and those not guilty of the sin of infidelity and who live according to the dictates of their conscience. What kind of infidels are guilty of the sin of infidelity? All those unbaptized persons are guilty who do not embrace the true religion, although the truths thereof have been sufficiently made known to them. Like many of the Jews of old, of whom our Lord said that they had no excuse for their sins because he had spoken to them. All those unbaptized persons are guilty who have received sufficient light to know the truth or at least to understand the danger of their position and the obligation of making serious inquiries to ascertain and embrace the truth, but neglect to do so. And all those are guilty of the sin of infidelity who willfully deny the truth and obstinately resist it. Why is it that positive infidels, those are infidels guilty of the sin of infidel, why is it positive infidels are not saved? Positive infidels or infidels guilty of the sin of infidelity are not saved because, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, positive infidelity being willful obstinacy, palpable contradiction, and public contempt of divine revelation and of the precepts of the gospel is one of the most grievous sins in the sight of God and his holy church. St. Thomas says that if such men die in this disposition of mind, they are infallibly lost because without faith 
it is impossible to please God. Which kind of infidels are not guilty of the sin of infidelity but commit other grievous sins? Those who are not guilty of the sin of infidelity but commit other grievous sins are all those unbaptized persons who never had an opportunity of knowing the true religion or becoming aware of the obligation of seeking and embracing it, but who do not live up to the dictates of their conscience. Will this class of infidels be lost? This class of infidels will be lost not on account of their infidelity, which was no sin for them, but on account of other grievous sins which they committed against their conscience. St. Paul says, For whoever have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. Will those infidels be lost who are not guilty of the sin infidelity and live up to their conscience? Will those infidels who are not guilty of the sin infidelity and are faithful in obeying the voice of their conscience? St. Thomas Aquinas says, If anyone was brought up in the wilderness or among brute beasts, and if he followed the law of nature to desire what is good and avoid what is wicked, we should certainly believe that God, by an inward inspiration, would reveal to him what he should believe or would send someone to him to preach the faith as he sent St. Peter to Cornelius. That's important. If a man falls the light of reason in pursuing good and avoiding evil, God will either show him by an inward inspiration what he needs to believe, send him an angel, or send him a preacher of faith to instruct him. Take a concrete example of a pagan who grew up in the forests of Montana. Of a chief named Walking Bear, Father de Smet, the great mission, Jesuit missionary to the Northwest, he's writing this happened in 1840 um, or 1841. So, of a chief named Walking Bear, Father de Smet wrote, quote, Among the chiefs, there was one who had always been a brave warrior and an upright man. He was then upwards of 80 years of age, but still healthy and vigorous. He was anxious to receive baptism. As soon as he was sufficiently instructed, I asked him to make an act of contrition for all the sins and offenses he might have committed against his Maker. No doubt, said he, I have done many things that have offended the Great Spirit, but it was unknowingly. I never in my life did anything which I knew to be evil. From my childhood, it has been my constant endeavor to avoid sin, and I never did a second time any action when I was told it was wrong. He's baptized under the name of Peter. Close quote, Father DeSmet. I never in my life did anything which I knew to be evil. From my childhood, it's been my constant endeavor to avoid sin, and I never did a second time any action when I was told it was wrong. In his journal, Father DeSmet asked, Are there in our Europe many Christians who could give this testimony of themselves? Chief Peter Walking Bear is a perfect example of what St. Thomas said. If a person has been reared in the forest, and yet follows the guides of natural reason in the pursuit of goodness and flight from evil ways, it is to be rigorously held as a certainty that God will either show him by an interior inspiration whatever he needs to believe, or he will send him some preacher of the faith. So we've considered the three types of infidels. Those who are guilty of the sin of infidelity, And if they die in that state, they'll be damned. Those who are not guilty of the sin sin of infidelity, but commit other mortal sins, if they die in that state, they'll be damned. And those who are not guilty of the sin of infidelity and lift up to the dictates of their conscience, and if they follow the light of reason, pursuing good and avoiding evil, God will either show them by an interior inspiration what they need to believe or send them a preacher of the faith to instruct them. Now let's consider the situation of heretics. What is a heretic? A heretic is any baptized person professing Christianity and choosing for himself what to believe and what not to believe as he pleases, in obstinate opposition to any particular truth which he knows is taught by the Catholic Church as a truth revealed by God. How many things then are required to make a person guilty of the sin of heresy? To make a person guilty of the sin of heresy, three things are required. One, he must be baptized and profess Christianity. This distinguishes him from an infidel or an unbeliever. Two, he must refuse to believe a truth revealed by God and taught by the church is so revealed. And three, he must obstinately, and that's an important point, he must obstinately adhere to error, preferring his own private judgment in matters of faith and morals to the infallible teaching of the Catholic Church. So how many types of heretics are there? There are three kinds of heretics. This sound familiar. Number one, those who are guilty of the sin of heresy. 
Number two, those who are not guilty of the sin of heresy but commit other grievous sins. And number three, those who are not guilty of the sin of heresy and live up to the dictates of their conscience. Who are guilty of the sin of heresy? Of the sin of heresy are guilty, one, all those baptized persons who profess Christianity and obstinately reject the truth revealed by God and taught by the church as so revealed. We think of people like our vice president. Number two, those who embrace an opinion contrary to faith maintain it obstinately and refuse to submit to the authority of the Catholic Church. We think of people like Nancy Pelosi. Number three, those who willfully doubt the truth of an article of faith for by such willful doubt they actually question God's knowledge and truth and to do this is to be guilty of heresy. Number four, those who know the Catholic Church to be the one true church but do not embrace her faith. Number five, those who could know the church if they would candidly search but who through indifference and other culpable motives neglect to do so. And number six, those who, like the Anglicans, think that they approach very near the Catholic Church because their prayers and ceremonies are like many prayers and ceremonies of the Catholic Church and because their creed is the Apostles' Creed. These are heretics in principle, for as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the real character of rank heresy consists in want of submission to the divine teaching authority in the head of the Church. Why are true heretics lost? True heretics are lost because by rejecting the divine teacher, the Catholic Church, they reject all divine teaching to do which is one of the most grievous sins. For this reason, the Holy Scripture condemns heresy in the strongest terms. A man, says St. Paul, that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, avoid, knowing that he who is such a one is subverted and sins, being condemned by his own judgment. And again he says, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema, that is to say, accursed. St. Paul also class sects or heresies among the works of the flesh and says that those who do such things shall not obtain the kingdom of God. Heretics are lost because they have no divine faith. St. Thomas Aquinas says to reject but one article of faith taught by the church is enough to destroy the faith, as one mortal sin is enough to destroy charity. For the virtue of faith does not consist merely in adhering to the holy scriptures and revering them as the word of God. It consists principally in submitting our intellect and will to the divine authority of the true church charged by Christ to expound them. St. Augustine says, I would not believe the Holy Scriptures were it not for the divine authority of the church. He, therefore, who despises and rejects this authority cannot have true faith. If he admits some supernatural truths, they are but simple opinions, as he makes those truths depend on his own judgment. And his divine faith is the beginning of salvation, the foundation and source of justification, and is found only in the true church. It is clear there is no salvation for one as long as he is a true heretic. Have heretics faith in Jesus Christ? St. Thomas Aquinas says, It is absurd for a heretic to say he believes in Christ. To believe in a person is to give our full consent to his word and all that he teaches. True faith, therefore, is absolute belief in Christ and all he taught. Hence, he who does not adhere to all that Christ has prescribed for our salvation has no more the doctrine of Christ in his church than the pagans, Jews, and Turks have. He is, says Christ, but a heathen and a publican, and therefore will be condemned to hell. Can a Christian be saved who has left the true church of Christ, the Holy Catholic Church? No, because the Church of Christ is the kingdom of God on earth, and he who leaves that kingdom shuts himself off from the kingdom of Christ in heaven. Which heretics are not guilty of the sin of heresy but commit other great sins? Those who are heretics without their fault and never had an opportunity of knowing better are not guilty of the sin of heresy, but if they do not live up to the dictates of their conscience, they will be lost, not on account of their heresy, which for them was no sin, but on account of other grievous sins which they committed. Will those heretics be saved who are not guilty of the sin of heresy and are faithful in living up to the dictates of their conscience? Inculpable ignorance of the true religion excuses a heathen from the sin of infidelity and a heretic from the sin of heresy. But it's important to note that the ignorance itself is not a means of salvation. From the fact that a person who lives up to the dictates of his conscience and who cannot sin against the true religion on account of being ignorant of it Many have drawn the false conclusion that such a person is saved, or in other words, is in the state of sanctifying grace, thus making ignorance a means of salvation or justification. If we want to make, sincerely not make great mistakes in explaining the revealed truth, out of the church there is no salvation, we must remember there are four great truths of salvation which everyone with the use of reason must know and believe in order to be saved. These four truths are, first, there is one God. Second, God rewards the good and punishes the guilty. Third, there are three persons in one God. And fourth, the second person, our Lord Jesus Christ, became man and died for our sins. 
It's a teaching of scripture and tradition. You can read the Athanasian Creed, for example, as well as those great doctors of the church, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Alphonsus. Over the past three centuries, this teaching has been reaffirmed by Rome on at least three separate occasions. Okay, so in order to avoid mistakes in explaining the great revealed truth of the church, there's no salvation. We must remember in the first place there are four truths that everyone with the use of reason must be believed to be saved. We must also clearly understand that no one can go to heaven unless he's in the state of sanctifying grace, and that sanctifying grace is not caused by inculpable ignorance. Inculpable ignorance, it's also called invincible ignorance, uh, it just means that a man could not remove this ignorance by using reasonable diligence to find out the truth. That's what it means. So invincible ignorance is not a sacrament. Invincible ignorance cannot even dispose the soul for receiving sanctifying grace, much less give this grace to the soul. Invincible ignorance has never been a means of grace or salvation, not even for invincibly ignorant people who live up to their conscience. We've already talked about invincibly ignorant Heathens that live up to the conscience, we're, we're talking about these here. But the principle is the same. Don't think that invincible ignorance is what moves a person to the state of grace. St. Thomas Aquinas points out, and just to remind ourselves, that God in his mercy will lead these souls to the knowledge of the necessary truths of salvation, even send them an angel if necessary to instruct them, rather than let them perish without their fault. If they accept that grace, they'll be saved as Catholics. So it's not the invincible ignorance that puts them in the state of grace. That's the important part. If they're invincibly ignorant and they're following the light of good, and following the light of reason to do what's good and avoid what's evil, then they will get what they need, whether it be an, an, a, a private revelation, whether it be an angel, whether it be a missionary, they will get what they need to make sure they're saved. But the, I just go through this parenthetically to make sure, because a lot of times you hear people explain it as if invincible ignorance is what disposes them. No. Is it not a very uncharitable doctrine to say no one can be saved out of the church? On the contrary, it is a very great act of charity to assert most emphatically that outside of the Catholic Church there is no salvation possible, for Christ and his apostles have taught this doctrine in very plain language. He who sincerely seeks the truth is glad to hear it and embrace it in order to be saved. But are there not many who would lose the affection of their friends, their comfortable homes, their temporal goods, prospects in business where they become Catholics? Would not Christ excuse them under such circumstances from becoming Catholic? As to the affection of friends, Christ has solemnly declared, He who loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As to, as to the loss of temporal gain, he has answered, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? But would it not be enough for such one to be Catholic in heart only without professing his religion publicly? Nor for Christ to solemnly declare that he who shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man shall be ashamed when he shall come in his majesty, and that of his Father and of the holy angels. But might not, not such a one safely put off being put, received in the church to the hour of death? To put off being received in the church to the hour of death is to abuse the mercy of God and expose oneself to the danger of losing the light and grace of faith and die a reprobate. What else keeps many from becoming Catholics? Many know very well that if they became Catholic, they must lead honest and sober lives, be pure, check their sinful passions, and this they're unwilling to do. Our Lord says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. There are none so deaf as those that will not hear. What follows from the fact that salvation can only be found in the Roman Catholic Church? It follows that it's a very impious for anyone to think and say it matters very little what a man believes provided he be an honest man. His exterior honesty may be sufficient to keep him out of prison, but that's not sufficient to keep him out of hell. What conclusion, therefore, should every non-Catholic draw from this conviction? From this conviction, every non-Catholic should draw the practical conclusion to become a Catholic. For when there's a question about eternal salvation and eternal damnation, a sensible man would take no chances. Just a few weeks ago, in his sermon on the Feast of St. George, Pope Francis reminded us all of this dogma when he said, quote, The church is a mother who gives us the faith, a mother who gives us an identity. Christian identity is belonging to the church because it is not possible to find Jesus outside the church. The great Paul VI said, Wanting to live with Jesus without the church, following Jesus outside the church, loving Jesus without the church is an absurd contradiction. Close quote. Pope Francis. Let's close. Today on this great feast of Pentecost, let us thank God for this gift, this priceless gift, belonging to the one true church, the one church outside of which 
There is no salvation. We've been given the priceless gift of belonging to the one true church, and we can never be thankful enough. But as great as that gift is, it is not enough to keep us from being damned. We started by asking how many people that we each know actually put God first in everything. Let us make absolutely sure that it can't be said of us that God is not first. Let us renew our devotion to Our Lady and beg her to give us the grace to strive with singleness of purpose to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice right unto our dying breath.